stay hyper-focused and disciplined when it comes to the pursuit of justice. And what that means is demanding justice for George Floyd. What it also means is no longer tolerating politicians that will take money away from schools in order to add money to militarized police. Right now in New York City, we, are, we have a police budget of $6 billion for the New York City Police Department, yet our public schools in our poorest and blackest and brownest school districts are constantly underfunded that kids do not have opportunity, educational opportunity, employment opportunity, housing opportunity. And when you defund opportunity and you take money away from schools and put it into investing in guns and into investing in, in militarized forces, what you are doing is that you are creating a self-fulfilling prophecy of social destabilization and violence. And it doesn't have to be that way. And the hope of this situation is that we can change it. We can change it. We can defund the priorities how that, that, uh, that we have set. One thing that we can do in New York City is look at New York City's funding priorities. Um, and we can also make sure that there are so many, like there's so many things that you can do right now. There's action you could take at the ballot box. There's action you can take with mutual aid. There's action you can take if you know if you've got a dollar in your pocket, you can send it to a bail fund, you can send it to a mutual aid organization that's giving meals, you can be out there in the streets delivering meals, and if you need help figuring out who to connect with, we're happy to connect you. Right now, you know what we're doing out here in our community. I I can just speak I'll just start off speaking right now what we're doing in our community is that we're organizing people here in the Bronx and Queens to deliver meals out to our elders and to our seniors so that people are, aren't hungry right now because so many people are unemployed and aren't getting um, stimulus payments. In we have also been fundraising out for um, on the ground grassroots organizations in Minnesota. Uh, so we've been fundraising for, um, I believe, Reclaim the Block in, in Minneapolis and Black Visions uh, Black Visions Minnesota, Black Visions Minneapolis, who have been doing active decarceral, decarceral work um, and fighting for racial justice. And so the first thing you can do is connect with grassroots organizations um, and support them with your time, support them with your follow on social media, support them um, with your amplification. You don't need money but you can give your time, you can give your skill, you can give your love, you can give your attention. And even if your support right now, even if where you're at right now is that you don't feel like you know enough, what you can do right now is follow some of these organizations and start to educate yourself on, and be curious about everything that's going on right now. Learn about what white supremacy actually is because it's not a person in a hood, it's a belief system that permeates through so much of the subconscious of our society because this is a country that was founded on slavery and evolved into Jim Crow and evolved into redlining and evolved into mass incarceration. One thing that you can also do right now is show up for the black people in your life, which is really important. Your coworkers, your neighbors, your friends, and don't ask them what they need. Show up for them and give them anything that you have. Um, that unconditionality is really important because we're going through a collective trauma. We're going through a collective trauma of COVID, a collective trauma of unemployment, a collective trauma of police brutality, a collective trauma of uncertainty about our future, a collective trauma of anxiety around where our future is going, and we, we can heal ourselves from that, but it requires community. And we need to come together and we need to educate ourselves. And, you know, if you are white, even if you're Latino, you know, even if you're a person of color, we still have and benefit from colorism in our community. Because racism is one thing, but also there's colorism in our communities as well. And that's something that we you can also educate yourself. Shed yourself of this ignorance of if you're Latino, you can't be racist. If you're XYZ, you can't be racist. 
you know these are not about again just like we said this is not about good apples and bad pa apples or racists or not racists this is about systems and beliefs that we've had that are in our culture um that are around us that we can grow our consciousness around and just because you identify a, something that you have done or a problematic thing that you have made done in the past it does not mean you're an irredeemable human being it doesn't even mean that you're a bad human being. it means that we are that we are raised in a society that does not care for all people in the same way and teaches people to not care for others in the same way sorry guys it says your the connection is bad um, it's not telling me that my connection is bad, so I don't see it when it's going in and out. I'm very sorry. Um, but that being said, I want to go with a few uh, more questions with what you got. Um, let's see. Someone says, how can we make sure the history of race in this country, anti-racist training is taught in our schools? One thing is that if you're an educator, don't whitewash MLK's history. Don't buy into this textbook, rose-colored, you know, white gaze, a historical view of Martin Luther King, because he did not just show up on Washington and said, I have a dream, and then the Civil Rights Act was passed. The man was a radical. And so one thing you can do is that you know during not just black history month but all all year round when we're teaching about mlk and when we're teaching about other black figures teach the full history because people don't know that mlk was a democratic socialist he denounced u.s imperialism he criticized uh poverty and frankly he was just getting started in so much of his advocacy when his life was taken and so one thing that we could do is even in the things that you are already teaching if you are an educator the things you are already teaching in school make sure that you are teaching it in a way that is true to life and true to history and really look at the lenses with which especially our history classes our literature classes, our art classes are, um, are there. So that's, that's one thing to, to do. Um, just taking a look at, at some other things. Um, someone says, how can I be a better ally during the pandemic? I'd like to be protesting in New York City, but it feels too risky. Um, I saw I saw the end of that question before. So one thing um, you know about activism and protesting in general is, first of all, let's not um, let's not forget that we are that this is happening in the context of an unprecedented global pandemic. If you are immunocompromised if you feel like it is like uh, if you feel for you right now that you cannot be whether you have a disability whether you're immunocompromised if you have any other if you have a mental health issue that you're concerned about being triggered out there you know there are multiple ways to um to contribute and there's multiple ways to give so you know one thing that I would say is to look out for your health and if you are going out still look out for your health make sure that you're wearing masks um, try to be socially distanced please you know bring hand sanitizer with you it's really important because this is happening in the middle of of a pandemic um, and so one of the things that you can do is read engage in anti-racist literature and work um, you can google it you can take a look at it uh, you can donate uh, to anti-racist organizations criminal justice um, you know, or rather criminal reform organizations, racial justice organizations, housing. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that you can do, but there's a lot of resources. Um, let's see.
Let's see. Someone said, can we agree that riots are not the answer? You know, I think this is an important thing for us to talk about um, because, you know, this, what's happening right now is not an outcome that any person wants. No one wants us to be at, at this type of perilous point. No one wants to feel this way. No one wants to feel this endangered. No one wants to feel this on the cusp. Um, but it's important to also understand this context that we're operating in. Um, when, you know, when people talk about riots, they try to, they're saying, they try to blame this on, on you know, James Baldwin has an excellent, um, uh, kind of has, has, has an excellent thought that he had said uh, during one of these interviews when someone had asked him, you know, what about people that, that take TVs? And what he said is, you know, he talks about the history of the black community and uh, essentially says, you know, how can you accuse a people that have been stolen, that have been robbed of everything, of looting? And, um, and when you, so I completely understand um, because we don't want to be at this point, but how did we get to this point is the question that we need to ask. And how do we dismantle the conditions that have created this point is the much more sustainable path to go down because the conditions that led us to this point are what created the riots and uh, or not even riots you know the the conditions uh, that led us into this point are what created um this moment and this instability so housing discrimination record income inequality, record unemployment. Uh, you know, these, what we are seeing with the Minnesota Police Department, you know, clearly this officer had 18 complaints, many of them violent, and he was still on the job in communities. Every single time that a person dismissed one of these violent incidents and sent him back out, they were putting the community at risk every single time. And a person does not get 18 complaints on them dismissed by accident. That does not happen by accident. That is systemic. That is a systemic problem. It points to broken systems. So we wanna prevent this from happening. We need to fix broken systems. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Um, so these are, are an incredibly, incredibly important, you know, all of these are incredibly important things for, for us to take a look at. Um, I'm uh, continuing on here, taking a look at some of your questions. Um, let's see. Um, Sorry, y'all, I'm just taking a, a look at some of your questions. There's so many here. Um, let's see. What do you think about WHO, US broken relations, which also happened today? Um, listen, this president is withdrawing us from a global community. And this is something that authoritarians do. Um, and that is what Donald Trump is. He is an authoritarian. He is withdrawn from a global community. And um, this is just an ultimate, you know, cut, your, cut off your nose to spite your face kind of moment. Um, the WHO focuses on vaccines and they focus on, on making sure that we are having global communication and um and you know uh, essentially that that we're working together globally from a public health perspective whether it's vaccines whether it's coordinated response it's whether it's um whether it's you know viral tracking or other disease tracking and now is not the moment for us to be withdrawing from uh global community it's 
in fact, now is a moment where we should be looking at global community now more than ever. Um, and even when it comes to systems and organizations that may not be perfect and that need to be fixed or may have made mistakes, that is the time to lean in. And that is the time to ask questions, but that is not the time to withdraw. Um, and so of course it is, it is an utter mistake. Um, I'll do one more question and then I'll head out. Um, let's see. Sorry, y'all, I'm just, um, just coming in here. Just taking a look at all of your questions. Um, how should the Latinx community focus on ending our anti-Black contributions? This is such an important question. Um, and so, I think it's an important question and it's an important conversation that we need to have as Latinos, Latinas, and the Latinx community. Um, because we're, we are, our community is, and who we are is so, so diverse in its identity, right? Um, because to be Latino, or for example, I'll take my, um, I'll take, I'll take my life, I'll take my example. As a Boricua, as a Puerto Ricanian, my heritage and my identity you know in the united states i am latina and that's just like what you are right but you know that you go back home or you go back to la isla or you go back in your your identidad as a latina or just as a as a human being um in puerto rico you are you know what i am like even in terms of my dna or what goes into me is that you know i am indigenous my heritage my roots my ethnic makeup or my I, I suppose my racial makeup because you know as we're taking the census latinos are not a race right we're we're an ethnicity and so every time you take a, a census or every time you have to check a box um latino is not under the racial section and so they oftentimes they make you choose black white indigenous um asian etc and the answer is that for many of us we are all or most of the above um, my heritage is native my heritage is black and my heritage is spanish european um, and what colonization has done to latinos has essentially been an indoctrination that proximity to whiteness is a form of safety or a form of elevated status. Um, and so you could be super brown and check off the white box because a lot of folks are taught that in America, anything not the white box takes away certain privileges and protections. And we hear it all the time. Um, pelo bueno, pelo malo. That's about proximity to whiteness. Pelo bueno is pelo hair that is more more white looking or Europe Eurocentric. Pelo malo has historically been a term that is um, hair that's more Afrocentric, and it's wrong. And in my family, you know, if you actually saw my family makeup or a photo of my family. My family is like the whole spectrum. I have Afro Latino family. And I'll never forget the moment when my goddaughter at two years old, three years old, asked me to have her curly hair straightened at a salon. And I asked her, why on earth do you want your beautiful hair changed? And she had already internalized at two, three years old that it was Malo, that it was 
less than, that it was undesirable. And, um, and that's wrong. And so there's a lot of people in our family that we have to have dinner table conversations in Latinidad as well. Um, you know, about, about, you know, when babies are born, like, como se salió, like, all of this stuff is colonized language. And, um, and colorism is a very real thing. And it also manifests in kind of self-hatred as well. Um, I remember, you know, so Spanish was my first language spoken at home. And I learned English second. And I remember, you know, I moved to a white school district. And these these uh, scripts that you learn almost subconsciously happen very quickly. And I remember as a kid, um, I slowly started to grow embarrassed of speaking Spanish in public, um, especially in white areas, like in a classroom, um, if I had to call my mom or something like that, or had to talk to my family on a pay phone. And, uh, and I, you know, my, I grew up around family that did not speak English. And so I, I slowly, as a child, didn't even realize, but I slowly started whispering, speaking Spanish on the phone. That is, all of this is very deeply learned psychologically and culturally kind of absorbed behavior. Um, and it's not your fault. It's not because you're a bad person. It's because this is the water that we're swimming in. And this is part of the deep transformation that we need to make as a country and as a society. Um, and it requires a lot of dedication in learning about our history and learning about our context. Um, but this is work that everybody has to do, not just white people, not just white people. This is work that everyone has to do. And so um, that, and it's, it's also an important question because you can experience racism and also, you know, have been subjected to it. And in these mechanisms of survival of navigating around it, you learn that proximity to kind of this idea of whiteness um, it becomes a survival mechanism. And the ability to choose that is a privilege, even if it comes from a place of trauma. So all of this stuff, is um is very it's you know it, it's a lot of stuff to untangle um but it is work that we all have to do and so anyways um i'm just gonna pop off i just wanted to kind of come in here and give some thoughts to you all and let you know that we are going to get through this we're going to get this through this together and we are going to get through this together and have a new day. And that new day will be better. It will be more just. And it, it will require a lot of um, it's going to require a lot of endurance from us. But that's because this is not about us. This is about our children. This is about our grandchildren. And this is about the world that we're going to leave. And I, for one, will not leave. I refuse to leave a worse world um, for those to come. So thank you all so much. Stay safe. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Oh, let me make sure I switch these so that you guys can hear me. Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining. Just figured I'd talk about a few things. You know, I've been, um, sorry y'all, just making sure. I'm away from people, there's no one on the street, so I'm just taking some time um, to, to get some fresh air while we um, collect ourselves in the midst of all of this. But you know, I've been really reflecting a lot 
about this moment, um, because as everyone knows, there's a lot going on, and I just kind of wanted the opportunity to connect with you all. But one of the things that I is folks who call, you know, who are talking about this unrest. And if you are calling for an end to this unrest, and if you are calling for an end to all of this, but you are not calling for the end of the conditions that created the unrest, you are a hypocrite. If you don't want to call, if you're trying to call for the end of unrest, but you don't believe healthcare is a human right, if you're afraid to say black lives matter, if you don't, if you're too scared to call out police brutality, then you aren't asking for an end of unrest. You are asking for injustice to continue and for your people to continue to endure the violence of poverty, the violence of a lack of housing access, the violence of police brutality, and not say a damn thing. That's what you're asking for. So if you're out here calling for the end of unrest, then you better be calling for healthcare as a human right. You better be ca- calling for accountability in our policing. You better be supporting community review boards. You better be supporting uh, you know, the end of housing discrimination. You better be standing up to for-profit real estate developers that are intimidating people and trying to evict them from their homes. That's what you better be calling for. Because if you don't call for those things and you're asking for the end of unrest, all you're asking for is the continuation of quiet oppression. So if you want the end of unrest, then you should be asking for measures that actually liberate people in their lives from the oppression of economic and social (coughs) inequity. (coughs) Um, And those are just some of my thoughts because, you know, I just can't, I can't with folks that are saying, we need to stop this unrest. We need to stop violence as though charging pers- someone a thousand dollars a month for insulin that they need to survive isn't violent. That is violent. And uh, allowing people to die in these systems is just wrong. So, you know, the way that we end this and the way that we move through this is by establishing justice. Um, And that is the ultimate way of creating peace and prosperity. And so, you know, that's just the thing that I want us to to really focus on is what is your holistic view of this moment? And this is not to condone violence. This is not to condone any of that. But it is also to say, you know, if... If you were silent on these issues until property got damaged, if you weren't, if you didn't feel urgency about these issues until property got damaged, we have to really ask ourselves the question as to why so many people were okay ignoring these problems until a window got broken. Why does it take that for people to pay attention? Um, Because it shouldn't. And what we need is a commitment to solving these problems without needing to get that far. And when our society does that, we will be in a better place. And we can start today. You know, so much of these problems and so much of this unrest could have been prevented if this officer was just arrested for the on-camera murder that he he had committed. But because there was so much resistance, because there was so much resistance to the idea of that accountability, this situation got out of control. And so instead of just telling people to go back to normal, let's create a new world. One where all people are held to the same standard of the rule of law. Sorry, I'm passing by some folks. Um, And um, one where people are where, where the justice that a person gets for their crimes is not dependent on who they work for or how much money they have, but by the actual deed that was done. 
that is what justice looks like. And so I just wanted to leave you all with that quick thought. Um, and I thank you all for paying attention. And I thank you all for trying to work for the true peace, which is a just society. Thank you so much. When the law approaches, bear witness to one of the realest lyricists who ever did it. Wasn't quitted from the charges I committed, nigga. Let's get it. The game ain't never changed, man. It's just these niggas in it. Most these niggas pretending to mimic what's on television. That's why when I spit it, all the hood niggas feel it. Everything you can do in the hood, nigga, I done did it. You can see me in my city riding through like P. Diddy in the cage style, Billy, black on black, extra crispy. I'm fly as a frisbee. I'm high. Got them haters looking sick, bout to make them overdose.